In a time of celebrity obsession, cancel culture and wokeness, there has been a trend in scrutinising once revered public figures and then shaming them for not living up to the shifting and increasingly harsh judgement of the new morality. A strange and refreshing reversal of this trend has been the revision of the life of recently passed Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, who died just short of his 100th birthday in April of 2021. Most people under the age of 50 have only heard reference to Prince Philip in terms of his numerous and consistent gaffes that the media delights in exposing while presenting him as a sour, bad-tempered dinosaur. He was consistently portrayed as either a dim-witted buffoon committing cringeworthy and embarrassing faux pas, or otherwise as a bitter and entitled royal nobody who was completely out of touch with the modern world. That was certainly the image I had grown up with, and there was little else published that challenged that projection of him. As he lay gravely ill in hospital, with the media frenzy instead being preoccupied with Harry, Megan and their Oprah scandal, the few references that emerged mentioning Prince Philip highlighted his distress at the effect the scandal was having on both sides of the family divide. News began to surface of his attempts, despite being close to death, to reconcile the factions, and we were finally being shown that he was capable of real human emotions, such as grief, empathy and despair. It seemed as though Prince Philip was at last being portrayed as more than just the two-dimensional cartoon character that he had been for decades. On the 9th of April, as news broke of his death, there were the obligatory and familiar articles listing the complete set of gaffes that he had made over his long lifetime. But these articles soon began to seem increasingly infantile as they started to contrast with the growing number of positive reviews for the life of this extraordinary man. I had never before considered Prince Philip as a hero figure, much less someone to describe as a role model. However, as the months have rolled on and details have emerged of his life of service, duty and unswerving devotion to his wife, the Queen, I thought it appropriate to add him to the pantheon of heroes worthy of study and in many ways to emulate. Prince Philip was born on a dining room table in a villa on the Greek island of Corfu in 1921. He was the fifth and youngest of five children, having four older sisters. His father, Prince Andrew, was a prince of both Denmark and Greece, while his mother, Princess Alice, had ties to the British, Prussian and Russian royal families. Despite their Protestant origins, Philip was baptised as an Orthodox Greek and, but for the fortunes of war, might have remained there, an insignificant Byzantine noble on the fringes of Mediterranean Europe. In the Greco-Turkish War that followed the partition of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, Greece had suffered significant losses in battle and in territory, for which Philip's father was apportioned some blame. Heads were soon rolling, and the family was quickly evacuated by the British Navy, and they moved from Italy through to France, fearful of assassination. All four of Philip's older sisters eventually married into the German nobility. His substantially deaf mother was later diagnosed with schizophrenia and placed into a Swiss mental asylum, while his father settled in Monte Carlo with a new mistress. The young and increasingly abandoned Philip was initially sent to school in Britain under the guardianship of his uncle, George Mountbatten, but later he was sent to a unique and cutting-edge boarding school in Germany, sponsored by his brother-in-law, the Margrave of Baden, which was founded by the remarkable Jewish educator, Kurt Hahn. Now, Herr Hahn was himself a fascinating and remarkable man, and it's worth taking a few moments getting to know his story, because his philosophy of education was to have a profound effect on the young prince's future. 
Kurt Hahn was born in Berlin to Jewish parents in 1886. Excelling at school, he attended a number of prestigious universities, including a stint at Oxford. At the outbreak of World War I, he worked for the German Department of Foreign Affairs, eventually coming to work as a personal assistant to Prince Max von Baden, the last Imperial Chancellor of Germany, together founding the Schule Schloss Salem system of boarding schools, of which he became headmaster, teaching Greek philosophy, history, politics and literature. The horrors of the First World War had convinced Hahn that current European models of education were fundamentally flawed and that a total restructuring of the school system was necessary to take adolescents, whom he viewed as essentially decent and positive, and provide them with the experiences necessary to prevent their mass brainwashing by governments and instead to take their place as mature and integrated members of a peaceful and progressive modern society. Hahn viewed the societal degeneracy that led to World War I to be a decline in several key areas that were critical to address if society was to have any hope of redemption in the future. First, he saw a decline of fitness which he believed was due to modern methods of locomotion. Second, he felt there was a decline of initiative and enterprise due to excessive indulgence in passive entertainment. Thirdly, he noticed a decline of memory and imagination in young people, which he felt was due to the confined restlessness of modern life. And fourth, he noticed a decline of skill and care, which he believed to be due to the weakened tradition of craftsmanship. Fifth, he felt that there was a decline in self-discipline which was due to the ever-present availability of stimulants and tranquilizers. And sixth and finally, he believed that the war was a symptom of the decline of compassion, which was due to the accelerated pace and selfishness of modern life. Hahn's formula for addressing these ills was comprised of four key pillars. First, fitness training, which he felt was the discipline and determination of the mind being expressed through the body. Second, he believed in the value of expeditions via sea or land to engage in long, challenging endurance tasks. Thirdly, he believed in the assignment of projects to students which would involve crafts and manual skills to improve their skill and attention to detail. Fourth and finally, and perhaps most importantly, he felt the necessity of public service such as in rescue or other community activities, for example, life-saving, firefighting or first aid. Hahn felt that schools that only focused on the traditional study of seven liberal arts and sciences failed to develop these other qualities and made for an adult that became ever more physically and mentally vulnerable, isolated and selfish. He also believed that one of the great strengths of British and other democracies was the emphasis they played on the importance of the individual and the agency that we all have as individuals in shaping the world. The central role of education to Hahn was to empower a student with the confidence and tools necessary to make the most of themselves and to help others to do the same, rather than be passive cogs in a collective machine. As the Nazi party rose to power, Hahn became increasingly vocal about his opposition to it, until he was eventually forced to abandon the country and fled to Britain, subsequently setting up a similar school called Gordonston in Scotland, with Prince Philip following him there soon after, where he was to spend his remaining school years under his tutelage. By now, Philip's mother Alice had been for some time in a mental institution. His father was distant and uninvolved, while the rest of his family took only cursory interest in his welfare, meaning that Philip grew up without any tangible emotional support. He became correspondingly independent, tough, 
and self-reliant and intensely private, traits that would remain with him throughout his long life. In 1937, Philip's sister Cecile, her husband Georg, Grand Duke of Hesse, a prominent Nazi party member, and their three children and the Grand Duke's mother-in-law were killed in a plane crash and the 16-year-old Prince Philip flew over to Germany for their funeral, exposed firsthand to the Nazi regime his mentor had fled from. Images of that time have been used to tarnish Philip despite his never having voiced support for Hitler or the regime. Returning to Scotland, Philip flourished at Gordonston, being an avid sportsman, adventurer and now also an accomplished sailor. He finished school in 1939 at the top of his class and, having fallen in love with the sea, attended Dartmouth Naval College soon after. His mother had, meanwhile, been repatriated to Greece, so Philip leapt at the chance to live with her again, leaving college to join her. His cousin, the King of Greece, nevertheless encouraged him to return to England to finish his studies, which he did, achieving high distinctions. As the war broke, he served, still as a Greek citizen, on a number of British battleships as a midshipman, protecting convoys in the Indian Ocean eventually being transferred to the Mediterranean fleet in 1941. He continued his studies, eventually passing his exams by topping four out of five assessments. He participated in the Battle of Crete, the Battle of Cape Matapan, and graduated his ongoing studies to become one of the youngest first lieutenants in the history of the Royal Navy in 1942. Now transferred to a destroyer, escorting fleets around Britain, then supporting the Allied landings in Sicily, he was cited a number of times for decisive action and strategies that saved his ship from night bomber attacks. By 1944, he was transferred to the British Pacific Fleet, again in the thick of the action, and by 1945 was in Tokyo Bay at the signing of the Japanese surrender. By 1946, he was back in Portsmouth, where he was posted as an instructor at the Naval School. Now, while all this was going on, Philip was corresponding with then Princess Elizabeth, whom he had met whilst still a cadet at Naval College in 1939. During a royal visit, Prince Philip was asked by his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, to escort Elizabeth and Margaret around the college. Elizabeth, who was still only 13, developed a crush on the dashing and handsome young cadet, and as the war broke out, he also found some solace in corresponding with the only person in the world who seemed to take any interest in his welfare. By the end of the war, he and Elizabeth, now 19, had been corresponding for some years, and they developed a strong bond of affection. In 1946, Philip approached the king for permission to marry her, which was granted in 1947, when Elizabeth turned 21. But first, it was necessary under British law that he renounce his Greek and Danish titles and become a naturalised British citizen, which he did, taking on his uncle's surname of Mountbatten. Philip's father had meanwhile died during the war, and with the Nazis plundering his home in Monaco, there was nothing left to inherit and so, being stateless and without any personal land holdings, he was literally a prince and a pauper, which meant that at the renunciation of his titles, he was now no longer even a prince, just a mid-ranked foreign naval officer. Even his Greek Orthodox baptism had to be publicly regularised by the Archbishop of Canterbury, as though his previous Christian heritage was invalid just so that he could be admitted to the Church of England in order to marry Elizabeth. And so this intensely private naval lieutenant left his whole history behind and married a princess in a ceremony in November of 1947, which was broadcast to hundreds of millions of viewers around the world. Given the recent war, 
None of his German relations, including his three surviving sisters, were invited to the wedding. On the morning of the ceremony, the king proclaimed Philip the Duke of Edinburgh and gave him a number of other fitting titles. It would, after all, be unseemly for his daughter to marry a nobody. And so Philip, having dumped his double prince titles, picked up a dukedom instead. He continued to serve in the Royal Navy and was eventually promoted to Lieutenant Commander while serving in Malta between 1949 and 1950. By this time, the couple had two children, Charles, born in 1948, and Anne, born in 1950. Life was great for Philip at this time. He was a career naval officer, and his wife, still a princess and unburdened by the social commitments of leadership, was able to make a home for them with their two children, giving them the kind of family life he had never managed to experience as a boy. He felt totally in charge, and his love of adventure was eventually stoked by the government when it sent them both on a royal tour around the world in 1952. And then King George VI died while they were on safari in Kenya. It was Philip who was given the news, and reports say that he sat, slumped in a chair, as the implications slowly began to sink in. No longer was he going to be the head of his family, nor would he be able to pursue the naval career he had worked so hard to excel at. From this moment on, he would be walking behind his wife and function solely in the capacity of supporting her as she took on the responsibility of the monarch of the United Kingdom. Even his children would not carry his name, a sore point with Philip remarking in frustration that he felt like an amoeba. Even the most minor decision now had to be approved by the Queen. In a civilization where women traditionally leave their families and often their careers behind, change their names and even their religion to that of their husbands, in this case it was Philip who did so. He was a man's man, masculine and an avid sportsman, surrounded since boyhood by men in a men's world. He was competitive and fiercely independent, yet he was rarely heard to complain or grumble about the restrictions and limitations that were now forced upon him, though sources relate that it was a huge culture shock and difficult for him to adapt to at first. But adapt he did. His solution was to focus on the fourth and most important pillar of the Gordonston School, service to others, becoming over the next 65 years patron of about 800 organizations, most of them involving youth and education, technology, sporting and environmental causes. He was an environmentalist long before it became fashionable, even co-authoring several books on the subject and making a significant number of his five and a half thousand personally written speeches about conservation, a subject that his son Charles would come to adopt as well. Philip spoke about the greenhouse effect, climate change and deforestation in speeches long before most academics even adopted the terms. He would write and deliver over 70 speeches a year over a span of 65 years in a whirlwind schedule of travel that catered to his high energy levels and serious commitment to the causes he was passionate about. And yet throughout that time, he never took himself too seriously often using his speeches to make jokes at his own expense and entertainment of his audience. He once remarked to a group of boys when opening a school building, a lot of time and energy has been spent on arranging for you to listen to me to take a long time to declare open a building which everyone knows is open already. And on another occasion, I declare this thing open, whatever it is. He also once made the remark at a dental conference, dontopedology is the science of opening your mouth and putting your foot in it, a science which I have practiced for a good many years. His humor was definitely dry, irreverent and frequently politically incorrect. 
Philip was well aware that it often painted him, in his own words, as a cantankerous old sod, yet he was quite unafraid to speak his mind despite the fallout, especially when it concerned his disdain for celebrities, who he viewed as selfish, self-absorbed and generally immoral, contributing little to the progress of society. Many of his speeches echoed the ethos of his mentor Hahn and the Gordonston School, whether officiating at the ceremony of newly independent Ghana in 1958, where he said, the essence of freedom is discipline and self-control. Or to students at the British Exploration Society, where he warned that they should not allow the post-war benefits of easy living to stifle their spirit of adventure and quest for personal growth. He frequently gave inspirational speeches to schoolchildren, outlining the power of the individual to influence the world and how this principle was the guiding tenet of our society. Some of his most infamous gaffes were either playful attempts at breaking nervous tension or otherwise observations which had been taken out of their wider context. When he privately commented to a British student living in China that if he stayed there much longer he would go slitty-eyed, it was in direct counter-reference to a common Chinese quip at the time about their own students living in Britain much longer going round-eyed, and yet few journalists have ever bothered to point this out. On another occasion, when he was reported as saying to an Australian Aboriginal, do you still throw spears at each other? Again, nobody bothered to point out in the ensuing media outrage that in a number of remote communities following unprecedented land rights legislation, elders were being given legal authority to dispense tribal justice to wayward youths in an attempt to curb crime without sentencing them to a white man's jail, where the suicide rate among Aboriginals was alarmingly high. Spearing had long been a punishment for men who had committed a serious crime, with even Governor Arthur Phillip being famously speared in 1790 in retribution for abducting an Aboriginal boy. Phillip certainly knew his history, and he was widely enough read and travelled to know of these unprecedented legal issues. We need to remember that Philip was a fully qualified British naval commander at the top of his class, as well as an accomplished navigator, sailor, writer, and even a qualified airplane and helicopter pilot with nearly 6,000 flying hours under his belt. Anybody who thinks he was a dim-witted buffoon, out of touch with world issues or social problems, has seriously underestimated Philip's broad and sweeping intellect and would do well to read a few of his speeches rather than focus on sensationalist gaffes that were often taken way out of context. His extraordinary breadth of patronage gave him access to and frequent exchanges with intellectuals, business, military and sporting giants as well as cutting-edge theories and ongoing briefs about the state of the country's youth education and employment. More than any other royal, Philip was up to his eyeballs in information and could converse on a diverse range of topics with almost anyone when he cared to, which was rarely in front of a camera. In fact, he almost seemed to relish being caricatured as a Monty Python type of moron and rarely got angry about it, even becoming patron of the Cartoon Museum in London and an avid collector of cartoon caricatures of the royals, displaying them prominently and humorously around the home. During all those 65 years of serving the interests of his adopted Britain, he remained entirely devoted to his wife, the Queen, who, it also seems, was likewise devoted to him. When he despaired at his children not carrying his surname of Mountbatten, the Queen controversially made a decree to allow this to happen. She also declared that the Duke was to have place, preeminence and precedence next to her, on all occasions and in all meetings 
except where otherwise provided by Act of Parliament, which meant that, again, controversially, Philip would have precedence even over his son Charles, who was the Crown Prince. The normally reserved Queen remarked during her Diamond Jubilee speech that Philip was her constant strength and guide, not something you would expect from a buffoon. During their golden wedding anniversary in 1997, she said in her speech that he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. The grief and tears she displayed at his funeral shook the nation as well as the British tabloids who unused to seeing their monarch in such a state of distress, slowly began to revise their traditional lampooning of Philip and explore the man's legacy more deeply, even grudgingly comparing their loving relationship with that of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. A man Philip once remarked in his usual self-deprecating style, he believed was greatly his superior. Prince William once remarked of his grandfather's love of the Queen, he totally put his personal career aside to support her and he never takes the limelight, never oversteps the mark, always on her side and he's an unwavering companion. Philip's relationship to his children is shrouded in the usual mystery and strongly controlled public exposure we typically see in the royal family. This privacy screen was largely his making. He was as protective of his children's privacy as he was of his own and took great pains to give them the kind of personal development experiences he benefited from. The Queen giving Philip complete authority over their education. His love of horsemanship, polo and sailing were also adopted by his children and his environmentalism strongly influenced Charles in particular. But unlike Philip, Charles hated his time at Gordonston with its strong emphasis on physical and intellectual excellence and he and Philip's relationship was strained for some years. Philip once remarking about his son that he is a romantic, I am a pragmatist, and because I don't see things as a romantic would, I'm often perceived as unfeeling. It's fair to say that he never spared his children or grandchildren from the salty, quintessentially British sense of humour or blunt observations he was infamous for, and his grandchildren especially loved him for the circuit breaker effect it had on tension and stuffiness within domestic protocol. Philip's devotion to family was evident in the way he dealt with scandal, trying everything possible to reconcile Charles and Diana, even when others had abandoned all hope, then, at her funeral, encouraging his distraught grandsons to walk with him in the cortege. The more recent scandals involving Harry and Meghan saw the mystery comment about the potential blackness of their baby universally and unhesitatingly attributed to Philip by the media, until it emerged that he was actually quite fond of Megan and was certainly not the culprit. He was heartbroken not only at their leaving the UK, but also of the deepening rift and public fracturing of the family that, once again, he seemed powerless to halt. Philip was a man whose total devotion to family and duty left him with few real friends or anyone who could claim to know him well, with even his authorised biographers often struggling to extract deeper personal anecdotes from a man who thought his life wasn't at all interesting. Never a stickler for formality or protocol, he once visited a company of Royal Marines on exercise and after a brief hello was meant to attend a lavish lunch with senior officers, which he promptly torpedoed by sitting himself down on the ground among the troops and having a corporal spoon some of his rations into a mess tin and lunching with them instead, no doubt 
telling his usual politically incorrect and ribald stories, which earned him the affection and esteem he enjoyed from military men all over the world, even becoming a living god to a tribe of Vanuatu natives on Tanna. Philip made the public good his mission, particularly when it came to youth. In another nod to his mentor, he founded the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme in schools across the entire Commonwealth, as well as the Outward Bound organisation that encouraged personal development and toughness of character through adventure, challenge, personal accountability and public service. Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was certainly rough around the edges. He could be terse, often short-tempered and, like most dads, occasionally embarrassing. Maybe that was his own signature stress valve, who knows. But his ongoing commitment to excellence, far-sighted environmentalism, his dedication to the principles of his Jewish schoolmaster and his unswerving and tireless loyalty to his wife the Queen and his adopted country, while remaining throughout his long 99 years uncomplaining in her shadow, mark him out as a man of extraordinary fortitude and personal principles, though very relevant role model of stoicism and duty for generations to come. Channel of old England from Russian to Syria is 34.